That's 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 that he'll post there. Thank you, Paul. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay. We'll go ahead and move on. And I know that I just turned on the audio for the remote viewers. We had a little bit of technical difficulty there. Um, maybe, Dana, you could check to see if... Um, well, the audio should be on. Maybe we can just ask if everybody can hear. Okay. Okay. Um, so also, please RSVP for meetings uh, early. If you're planning on coming to the meeting, uh, we use the RSVPs to determine how much to order for breakfast and how many tables to have set up and things like that. We send out a meeting invite two weeks ahead of time and then another one a week ahead of time. Um, and hopefully, if you know you're going to be here, please RSVP so that we have a good headcount. Also, if you have tips or tricks of your own, we would love to hear uh, from you. So if you have tips or tricks, you can submit those uh, through our contact us form at rmnsug.org. And then also, if you are interested in presenting tips and tricks, uh, we would also like to know that. We know that there's a lot of different um, verticals and types of companies and all kinds of different ways, like little aha moments that happen along the NetSuite journey. And so that's what we're looking for in our tips and tricks is those things that aren't necessarily common knowledge, but it's like, oh, I solved this problem. This may be good for other people to know. So that's the idea of our tips and tricks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, meeting sponsorship. So the membership to our user group is free. Uh, the cost of our meetings is supported by two levels of sponsorship. We have Sweet App sponsors and Breakfast sponsors. We do have requirements for those sponsors. Sweet App sponsors must be available through SweetApp.com. And our Breakfast sponsors must offer NetSuite consulting services and have certified NetSuite consultants on staff. So currently, we have one meeting available for our Sweet App sponsorship uh, for 2020. Um, we are fortunately booking out pretty far, so that is ensuring the longevity of the user group to make sure that we can keep um, having these meetings, you know, for a long time. Um, for our breakfast sponsorship opportunities, we have four meetings available left in 2020. So if you or your company or if you know somebody that is interested in sponsoring our user group, you can go to rmnsug.org forward slash sponsorship and that'll give you all of the details that you need to know about sponsoring a meeting. Our upcoming meetings for, I should say 2019, um, our first, our next meeting is going to be in July. That is going to be an accounting spotlight. And then in September this year, we'll have an inventory management and then also a 2019.2 update uh, part of that meeting. In November, we will talk, we'll have a module overview, and that'll basically be all of these different plugins and modules and bundles that you can install into NetSuite. Uh, actually, is that, no, maybe that's not true. Module overview. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Okay, yeah, so the module overview will be talking about what's included, what the additional modules are, and then I think having some bundle options in there would be good too. Um, then in January 2020, we are going to go through our suite analytics, and um, I'll talk a little bit about that more later today. Uh, in March next year, we'll have our 2020.1 update, and then, our, and then we're not quite sure about the topic yet to be announced. And then May of 2020, we'll have our workflow and suite world update. So the reason we can go so far out in our topics is we have a, basically a two-year rotating cycle of our core topics, and then we have um, uh, space to fill in new topics as well. And so we're we're looking further, for, you know, pretty far out and trying to line up our presentations, making sure that the content is relevant to the newest releases of NetSuite, um, and and basically looking forward as much as we can. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to go through uh, the Sweet World update. So like I said, I did attend Sweet World in what was that April? That was about a month ago now. Um, and I thought it was a, it was a really fantastic experience for me. Um, I went about, I think four years ago, and the, my overall impression back then was that it was very salesy. And we had basically just implemented NetSuite, and I went there to learn more about NetSuite, and then I felt like they were just trying to sell me on NetSuite, and I was like, well, we already bought it, so now teach me. And, and so, and it may have been, where I was in my NetSuite journey at that time too, is just not knowing what I didn't know and the sessions I signed up for. Um, but it definitely wasn't to me as salesy this time. And I and maybe that's part of the Oracle influence um, happening there, um, but it was really great. I think that there are too many sessions to attend and not enough time. Um, as I was going through the session um, content and all of the session options, there was, multiple times where I wanted to go to two different sessions, but they're at the same time and I had to prioritize and pick one, but I really just wanted to absorb as much as I could. Um, so that's, I mean, that's a good problem to have, I guess. I do wish that some of the sessions would dive deeper into the topics. Um, one example is there was an SQL class and it was called Master SQL class. And it was not a master class by any means. And the, the challenge for them is that they have 45 minutes or one hour to give, and maybe they just shouldn't have titled it SQL master class or SQL master class. Um, but there was like two or three different things that they went over and I was like, okay, well that's cool, but definitely not a master class. So I think that it's a challenge. Um, I think that we have the ability here to go into deeper into those types of topics. Um, and that's why being a part of the user group, I think, is a good idea. Uh, and coming to every single meeting, even if it, the topic doesn't necessarily apply directly to what you're doing, you always pick up little things here and there. Um, and then it kind of helps you understand everything all together. Uh, so Shaquille O'Neal was one of the uh, guest uh, interviews. Um, the EVP, Evan, I believe, um, interviewed Shaquille O'Neal. And... He is very funny and he's very smart, um, but he's not a good DJ because that night at the, they had a party and they, I don't know what his relationship is with net with Oracle NetSuite, but it's, they, they, they're getting a lot out of him. And so there was a party and there was a regular DJ and then he came on and did his DJ thing and it was not good. He's not a good DJ, um, but he's very funny. It was, it was fun anyway. Um, so if you go next year, what I would recommend to you is RSVP your sessions and reserve your Sweet Guru time slots the day that they open up because they all fill up very quickly. Um, the Sweet Guru stuff, if you don't know what that is, it gives you an opportunity to sit down with a, with a NetSuite Guru and go in, in depth in your account about a specific topic that you want to talk about and they'll help you solve a problem or problems that you have. But those, they're limited, and those slots fill up very, very quickly. So if you're interested in doing that and you go to Sweet World, you need to reserve it as, as soon as possible. Also, the sessions actually fill up as well. And there's usually a line, a line uh, going all the way down the hall for the, for the next session. And uh, if you didn't reserve it and they're full, then you can't get into that session. So definitely highly recommend reserving your sessions in advance. For me, it was a fantastic networking opportunity. Um, I got to sit around and talk to um, people at the meal times and talk about 
their company and what they do and how they use NetSuite and what their challenges are and what other services that they use to bolt onto NetSuite um, and just met a lot of great people that way. So um, the networking is, is really top notch. Um, and then also for me, the expo hall was really great. There was lots of great NetSuite partners, lots of good suite apps to explore. Um, just walking around and seeing all of the different things that you, that the bundles and, and um, plugins that, that work with NetSuite is, is very, very valuable. Things exist, companies are doing things that you maybe not have even thought of. So um, one, one big theme for me um, at, at the Suite World was this was Suite Analytics. There were probably four or five different sessions that they put on throughout the week on Suite Analytics. And I actually attended, I think, two or three of them um, because I really wanted to absorb as much as I could and, and learn about Suite Analytics. Um, I think it's definitely ready for prime time. Uh, there were some bugs in the 2018.2 version and I had opened a case and they said, oh yeah, that'll be fixed with the 2019.1 update. And so those, some of those fixes have been made. I think it's really time, if you haven't started digging into Suite Analytics, it's time, it's time to, to kind of start doing that. Um, we are gonna present on it in our January, upcoming January meeting, we'll cover it in detail. Um, I think that it'll, it, it's a very, very valuable tool that um, I think probably everyone here uh, could use. Uh, there's a new analytics portlet on the homepage to show graphs and charts that are created by the Suite Analytics, um, and it's really cool. It's dynamic. It updates every day. Um, there's not really a lot of functionality like that to do that now uh, without some serious customization. Um, some other cool things I learned about Suite Analytics is they have an instant formula validation uh, right inside the tool, and that means if you're building formulas for custom uh, results, you can see if your formula is going to work before you try and preview it. They say, hey, nope, your syntax is wrong, or this is going to be wrong, or they don't tell you exactly what's wrong, but they tell you it is wrong. So we're, we're getting there. Um, and then also in the formulas in Suite Analytics, they also have very good descriptions and examples of the formula expressions, uh, the expressions that are in the formulas, um, which right now, if you've tried to look at the, the help to understand an ex how an expression works or what it does, it's to me it's gibberish. I'm not a developer. Um, you know, maybe to Mike, he's like, oh yeah, I, I see what it's saying, but it doesn't make any sense to me. So they have very good user-friendly uh, descriptions and explanations for those uh, expressions now. Also, I discovered there are new expressions that are only available in Suite Analytics that are not available in Safe Searches. Uh, or any other custom formulas, which is an interesting thing. Maybe they'll roll those out to safe searches later on. And there were some some very valuable, um, there was, a, I think, a min and a max uh, that I encountered, which I don't think you can't, you can do that by, um, in a safe search, you can do that by the grouping, but you can't do it in the formula itself. So now, so that's just a couple that I discovered. Um, however, I don't think it's, it's gonna replace safe searches or reports anytime soon. Um, it's not even really re close to the capabilities yet. And I think over time, they're gonna keep building it. But um, uh, for example, it, you can't do financial reporting with it very well because it doesn't have like year over year comparison capabilities yet. It'll just show you the time frame that you put in as the criteria instead of taking that time frame and then comparing it to the same time frame last year. So I think there's a lot to be desired and, I, and they'll definitely build it out over time, but it's not gonna replace safe searches or reports in my opinion anytime soon. Um, it does work well in tandem with those things though. So um, Mike Cackline, he's a developer with Vertifor and um, he his focus was very different than my focus at Sweet World. And so this is some information from Mike and I'm just gonna read this because um, this is some information that he sent me about his uh, takeaways from Sweet World. So Suite QL and Suite Analytics API. So NetSuite is currently developing a SQL-like language called Suite QL. The prototype we saw allowed one to create a Suite Analytics workbook, export that to Suite QL, and then run that Suite QL using nQuery in a script. Suite QL would be a SQL 92 compliant, offer the syntax and flexibility we would expect for SQL, including subselects, in essence, Suite QL would allow us to create very advanced reports, which the Suite Analytics Workbook's uh, graphic user inter interface would not be able to produce. 
So it's nice to see that NetSuite is also focused on ensuring that SuiteQL, SuiteScript, and Suite Analytics workbooks were interchangeable, all using SuiteQL as the, back, as the backbone. Also, a new ODB, ODBC connector will also be available, which allows us to make these SuiteQL calls via an ODBC connection. So some of that may you know, fly over your head, some of it flies over mine, but I think um, it, to me, it, it says that they're investing a lot of effort into the suite analytics piece, and the suite QL is gonna be the backbone of it, and it'll be able to be customized uh, later on down the road. And I don't think any of this is available yet, but it's, it's NetSuite is, the suite world is all about things that are to come uh, that may or may not actually happen. But I think that this one is actually gonna happen. Um, also, um, Mike had a point about a focus on CRM from NetSuite, and I totally agree with this. Um, they had one uh, keynote session or part of a keynote that was like a very intriguing end-to-end -end customer sale process using their CRM system. So one keynote specifically walked through the CRM process, a process typically dominated by Salesforce, and today is comparatively basic in NetSuite. That being said, my takeaway was that NetSuite is going to be aggressively pursuing this area of the business flow. The key differentiator here will be NetSuite's immediate access to per customer financials data coupled with AI. What's AI? Coupled with AI. In short, if the CRM user experience I saw on the big screen becomes a reality and NetSuite CRM prices remain lower than Salesforce, I could see NetSuite being competitive in this space. I, and I agree with that. Um, the process, the, the customer life cycle that they showed, it was a, an imaginary uh, life cycle, but it was really cool the way that you could potentially use NetSuite um, throughout the entire process and not rely on Salesforce to be a key component of that, of that life cycle. Also from Mike, administrator and permissions, uh, woven through a few talks was the theme that NetSuite is clearly working to move users away from the administrator role as a day-to-day -day login. The goal, as I could best infer, was the ability to create fine-tuned admin roles. Example was having administrators who do not have access to view payroll data. Um, another example was admins who could only make structural changes via an SDF deployment. So the goal here is to, so if you're not, if you're not aware, there was a full access role um, that is now deprecated, and so you cannot add new people to the full access role. Um, and so instead, there's just the, the uh, admin user, and they call them uh, super, what do they say, super user roles. Um, but they want to be able to have people have that full access capability still, but then be able to limit it by um, you know, not seeing payroll data, not seeing human resources, you know, social security numbers on employee records, things like that. Um, and so I agree, Mike, they're definitely moving away from that that blanket all access admin so that you can fine tune um, what's going on with those. So another topic that um, stood out to me, which I for the last three or four months have been completely engaged in sales tax um, and especially sales tax as it applies to e-commerce. Um, and so NetSuite announced this and I did, had no idea called Sweet Tax. So the goal of Suite Tax is that it will help streamline the sales tax setup process via a setup wizard. And if you have ever done um, marketing campaigns, they have a little wizard that you can walk through that helps you set up the campaign. You can do it manually, but it's really clunky and kind of hard to know like what steps you're supposed to do. Um, and the Suite Tax uh, is supposed to fix all of that for in the tax part of NetSuite. Um, also, which is really interesting to me is that they, they have a built, they're gonna have a built-in sales tax calculation engine. So if you're not a, like up on the sales tax part of thing of NetSuite, basically with NetSuite right now, you can put in one sales tax for let's say a given state or a county or a city within that, that state. So you can have these um, tax agencies, right? And, but they're kind of hard coded and it's like, you, they're not dynamic. And so with this sales tax engine, you're going to be able to plug in um, or basically turn the functionality on say, okay, we have Nexus in these five states. And then anytime you're creating a sales order in NetSuite, the sales tax engine is going to look up the address and dynamically apply the sales tax rate. That's what Avalara does now. 
If Avalara, if you have a plug-in for Avalara, that's what their sales tax calculation does. Also, TaxJar has the same type of thing. So what NetSuite is doing is, and if I were Avalara, I'd be like, what? They're taking away what Avalara, you know, they're kind of part of their 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 built-in function, their uh, bundle function to NetSuite. But you can, um, you will still, be, if you're an Avalara customer or a TaxJar customer, you can still use um, those tax engines as part of the sweet tax uh, piece. So all is not lost for Avalara and TaxJar. Um, it just kind of changes the way that they are going to operate with NetSuite. Um, so all new NetSuite accounts starting in 2020 will have the new sweet tax system already built in. Um, if you uh, want early access, you can request early access to the sweet tax system for your account. Um, if you already have, uh, you know, all of your tax built out and, and ready to roll in or running in NetSuite, um, I don't know how sweet tax would affect that. It probably wouldn't affect it at all, um, but it would allow you to put in that tax calculation engine in the back end. So you can upgrade, and I imagine that at some point, they didn't say this, but in, in some upgrade at some point, uh, sweet tax will be upgraded in all accounts. Um, but they're kind of phasing it in in sex, in phases and just new accounts having it starting in 2020. A um, couple of other features of sweet taxes, yeah, you can set up non-taxable items by specific states and you can manage exemptions, uh, exemption certificates by customer. Um, and so I think that they're looking at um, gaps in what their system can do and they're filling those gaps. And that's a kind of a recurring theme. Um, so there's um, there was another piece. There was a, a, a mobile scanner barcoding and warehouse function that NetSuite now has available natively instead of using other options like RF Smart or um, Auslink. And so it seems to me that they're taking they're they're really focused on filling in the gaps in their offering. Another really cool thing that I think is cool that NetSuite um, is doing now is called the Brain Yard. It's uh, uh, um, it's a basically, well, it's a website. So it's netsuite.com forward slash brain yard. And what they're doing is they're putting together all of this research. Uh, they're, they're putting together benchmarking by industry. They're using data from NetSuite customers and they're creating KPIs by industry. And so if you're in retail or if you're in a services or software vertical, they are giving you benchmarking of what other NetSuite customers are doing. And you can see how you are stacking up to what everybody else is doing. And I think that's really cool because in the retail world that I've been in for so long, it's like, well, how do we do compared to everybody else? How you know, what, how is our, do our metrics compare? Are we doing good? Are we not doing good? And so um, BrainYard is designed to help us kind of figure that out and kind of give, give us a, an idea of where we are. Uh, they're providing research, they're doing surveys, they're doing state of industry reports. Um, there's also performance analysis, which is they're going to give you practical advice and guidance. Um, and it is, there's, I think, nine or ten different verticals that they're focusing on. Um, but it seems like that's they're, they're, they've covered most of the bases out there. Um, another um, kind of social piece that they're doing is uh, growwire.com. I shouldn't say social. It's like a blog. So growwire.com, and it's a new um, thing for NetSuite. It, they're going to provide video articles, podcasts, all about entrepreneurship and business innovation, people that are using um, NetSuite, learning about what other companies are doing. Um, they have a new podcast out, which has about three episodes right now. I just listened to the one um, about uh, two birds brewing out of Australia. It's really an interesting story to me. I, I like to learn about how businesses came to be and how they're doing and, and how they're growing. So um, that's some good information around the NetSuite world. Um, and then a couple of other just kind of random things, miscellaneous things that I picked up along the way. So under billing operations, you can set up, uh, you can set up to automatically bill sales orders or invoices. So this isn't new, but it's new to me. I built a workflow to do this a very long time ago. I didn't know that this existed, but basically if you don't want to have to manually bill those sales orders or invoices, you can set up this process that NetSuite will manually convert them into cash sales, basically, on a, on a schedule just for you. Not new, but new to me, so I thought it was pretty cool. Can you find out more about that? Um, it's called, 
Hmm. I, I have it in my notes, so okay. I'll, I'll let you know what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, also, upgrades will be able to be within a window of time based on your admin's need. So this is coming soon, not sure when yet, but instead of next week saying your upgrade is this date, this time, you're gonna have the ability to choose a window of when would be the opportune time for you to do your upgrade, which I just think that's just great customer, customer service focused change. Also, sandbox refreshers are now faster. They take about a day, or I think they can up to four days or something like that. Um, so they're saying that those are gonna be faster. Um, there's the app performance monitor or APM. There's a new record profiler. This is a future upgrade. The goal there is to help uh, assess performance bottlenecks in your NetSuite account. And then also in workflows, um, instances and in in history records tool. So if you go to a workflow in the upper right hand corner, there's a little more uh, option. You click on that and then it'll show you the instances and in histories uh, records tool. And basically you can see how many times that workflow ran, how many records it's open on now, and then you can choose a date range of when to delete that history information. So I think the default is set to three months. So any, any um, workflow information on a record will be deleted after three months. But let's say your account is really getting bloated with this type of information, you could set it to one month. Or if you need to, I think they have a maximum, maybe six months. But you can still set that. And I thought that was just kind of a really cool little uh, aha that I picked up. So there was a lot more to Sweet World. That was just kind of, I know that was maybe a lot, but that was a kind of a quick summary of, of what my experience was. I highly recommend that you go to Sweet World if you are um, buried in the NetSuite world um, and working and, and working with it and just learning new things. I, it's a great opportunity um, to network, to learn new things. They also have a bunch of training at the beginning of this of the Sweet World. So um, I'm going to move on. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors. Today, our Sweet App sponsor is Nolan Business Solutions. And they are kind of a hybrid company. I think they offer consulting services. They also offer Suite App um, bundles that you can install into NetSuite. And then I'd also like to thank our breakfast sponsor today, Systems Accountants. Um, they're in the back of the room and they have a little bit of a, of a unique um, proposition. They are consultants, but they are also um, a, a talent. I'm sorry, I forgot the, the one-liner. But they also, they have like, um, Basically, they find the talent and, and then they have clients and they match you up and it's, um, it's a really neat service that they, that they have. Um, also, so systems, or I'm sorry, yeah, systems accountants today, they're doing a raffle. They'll have an Amazon gift card, which who doesn't love Amazon. Um, and so there's a green bucket in the back, Put your, drop your business card in there. Um, and then before the open forum session today, we're gonna do a drawing for that Amazon gift card. Um, and then you get also a chance to talk to them and learn more about what they do, see if they can help you out at all. Okay, so that's it from me. Oh, I'm right on time, 9.10. So Diana, come on up. We're gonna hear from Diana at Nolan Business Solutions. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Okay, this is gonna be you think I'm not loud enough? I don't know. No. I don't know. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's make you a presenter. Where are you? You might have to. Yeah, I think I do. I need to get out. Go to the, the web version. Switch to your internet browser screen. Technology. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. We should be good. There you go. We should be good. Cool. All right. Corey thinks I need a microphone, but uh, my husband says differently. Um, but uh, just in case. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Diana Dunphy. I work with Nolan Business Solutions for about five years now. Um, been NetSuite Consulting for about 12 years back when NetSuite was
about this big and it was pretty easy to do implementation. A company that did a little bit more focusing. Um, we still do consulting work, um, but we've, we've, we've focused on um, some partnerships that we've had um, with NetSuite. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our products. I'm gonna focus on our bank reconciliation. It's, I think it's kind of our flagship um, and, and tech a little bit, um, you know, if you wanna come see me about some of the other offers that we have. Um, a little bit about Nolan. We actually started with Nolan, uh, with NetSuite in, in 2006. And we actually are the development team that did the fixed asset management system. Um, NetSuite bought it from us in 2011. So if you love fixed assets, go Nolan. If you don't love fixed assets, uh, but that's how we got started, um, was with the fixed asset module. Um, I actually just, start, we have another new user group that we're doing in California and the, um, their presentation is on the lease, the new lease agreement or leasing um, accounting that they have in the fixed asset module. So I got to see a little demo of it. It's actually pretty slick. They've done a good job with that. I just got a little brief um, view of it. But if you have lease accounting, it's a, a good um, addition they did to the fixed asset module. Um, how we got started in bank reconciliations, we, we are um, GP um, partners for about 30 years. And one of the products that we did for them was uh, the bank reconciliation. And so since we did fixed assets, and since we did um, in, in NetSuite, and we did bank records in, in Great Plains, it was just an easy transition to be able to offer that. Um, NetSuite's kind of starting to upgrade their uh, bank reconciliation tool a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go on things that we can do. Um, um, in In, in our product. Um, we have a main office here in the UK, um, have some people in Canada, and our other products are the electronic payments. Um, our brand new one, just started um, using it, is integrated. I can talk a little bit about that if you want to come see me. And Statement Direct, we're going to go over just a little bit, tiny bit today. It's part of our bank reconciliation. So highlights of what we can do, since I'm not going to do a demo, give you some highlights. We have the ability to take either a CSV or a BAI file, that's a bank file. And we can take, I have a client up in New York, 200 accounts from Bank of America, one download from the file, upload one bank reconciliation module, and can populate all 200 accounts. NetSuite can import some files, but it's one file at a time. So that would be 200 imports that they would have to do. There's um, lots of things that we can do with once it's in there with just one push of a button. Now we're going to take a look at real quick. Um, ACH bill payments can be 100 bill payments, but the bank takes that uh, amount. So we have the ability to put these rules together that allows you to say, well, match these 100 over here to this one ACH payment on the bank. So many to many, many to one, one to many. Um, generate journal entries. I, I kind of compare this to the memorized transactions in NetSuite. So we, we call them templates and we set up templates. A great example of a template that I might want to set up, um, two of them that come to mind. One is bank fees. The other one is ZBA transfers. So let's take bank fees. This template would have, I call them if then statements, if you see bank fees in my bank memo field, then create a journal entry. One push of a button can create templates, journal entries for hundreds of bank transactions. So you don't have to go in, make a journal entry and then have them match. Um, rules, just make sure that you're matching to the right one. Five checks issued on NetSuite for $200, one clears the bank, how do I tell ABR which one to match to? We give it intelligence with our rules. Um, on the flying GL transactions, um, we do support custom segments. So if you are using custom segments, those templates can populate your custom segments as well. Um, and then auto match of your voided bill payments. You have a bill payment, you voided it. With, when you uh, bring in those transactions from NetSuite into ABR, uh, it automatically would do that match. So you're not having to go find the $100 positive, find the $100 negative. So it's automatically done. 
I'm going to quickly go over this because I don't get a whole lot of time here. A process. We sit inside NetSuite, but we aren't NetSuite, just like any other bundle. So you extract those transactions, bring them over into the module. You import that bank statement that has 200 bank accounts on it. We have manual imports, or we can do this, we call it statement and direct. We go in with a secured file, bring that data in from your bank, automatically populate it. If anybody comes from QuickBooks, it's very similar to that idea of bringing it right right into your module. We run these auto matches. We run those templates, the, the uh, memorized transactions, get on the fly transactions, and then at the end, we run a reconciling report and have your um, closing reports that you can show. This is, without doing a full demo, this is kind of some highlights that I wanted to point out. This truly is one of my favorite features. A while ago, I said you can do many to many, many to one. This is just an example. I have three transactions that these three here total to this one over here. So I have some rules that said, hey, go ahead and match these because I gave it the parameters to match. What I love about this module is it doesn't just give you a check mark. It doesn't say, yep, it's cleared the bank and that's all you know about it. Here's what we do know. When we do a match, we create a match ID. That match ID is tied to these three transactions over here on the NetSuite. These cash sales all have match number 7923. So I have an auditor that comes in and says, well, hey, I see you have a cash sale for 24,000. I don't see that on your bank statement. I can run safe searches. Remember, this is a NetSuite, so now I have the ability to run safe searches on this. I run a safe search because I know the match number is 7923. All these matches numbers are gonna come up, these three on the bank side, run the same safe search, and I can now tell that auditor that three transactions made up that deposit on the one. So they always have that relationship. Again, you can write safe searches, gives you that information years to come. This is just an example of a template that I talked about earlier. Again, I, I like to refer to them as if-then statements. Here's my if. If it's a transaction type, and if you see that bank fees in my reference field, my then statement. That's about as technical as I get, by the way, if then. I kind of know if then else, but that takes me way, way back. Um, if you have this transaction, oops, go back. How do we go back? So if I have my uh, bank fees, then create a journal entry, put it into my bank service charges, put that in my memo, and by the way, hit my admin department. Pretty simple to write these templates. One button that says auto-generate will generate hundreds. I've got clients that have 150, 200 templates with one button will generate all these journal entries that they need to make. This is another, this is called our Reconcile Wizard. I, can I have one more minute? One more minute, I promise. Um, this is called, I call it a one-stop shop. Again, not technical, one-stop shop. When I talked about that customer at 200, she can, one file, import one bank statement with 200 file, uh, accounts on it, extract transactions from 200 accounts of NetSuite, match, do all of this matching for two, and all those templates on 200 accounts on one screen. So a lot of that process can be done with one push of a button. I won't go over this because they're giving me that signal to, to leave. Um, and this is all just about us. Thank you very much for your time. I'm back in the corner by the food. So come see me. Okay. So we will move on. Move to our main presentation. This is Margie Cominos. And let me give you the I'm going to switch to that. Okay. Good morning. Let's see. I don't can we turn this mic off? Yep. Because I have a we've got it off. Thank you. Let me turn this on and then make sure you can all okay. Can you hear me okay? All right, great, thank you. Put this to myself. 
Not so easy. Okay, I'll just sit it here. I, if you all want to get some coffee, it's going to just take me a couple minutes to set this up. Okay. This is a good time. Bagel. Bagels. Click on the window. Uh, what are you going? Yeah, application. And then pick it up. Not sure. And then. Oh, but I want to be able to share that. Well, I think you'll be able to alt tab. Okay. So I, I see that. Yeah. So I can do a switch. So I can see that fine. Do a switch to the browser. Okay. There you go. Oh, good. Perfect. Oh wait. Let me see this. Stay there. Um. Let me switch on um, go to meeting. Are you using the web version or the downloaded version? The download version. It is the downloaded version. Um, maybe if you just show your desk, if you just share the desktop instead, then it'll just show whatever's showing. So I go back. So, so go back to. Go to meeting. Yeah, it's. It's right here. Oh. So yes. yeah, click on like expand the whole thing, and then screen. Yeah. Oh, and then click on the screen thing. Yep. You have to click on the profile. This is no, click on that. Yeah. Then highlight that. And then share. Hmm, still not. What is clean screen? There we go. Got so it. Map. Okay. And is that little thing gone? Oh, let me shrink it. I don't see. I don't see it on here. Um, oh, you know what? It's going to show up up here, but it's not showing on the go to meeting. Okay. And, it's, and there's no chat bubbles coming up. We turned that off before, so. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I have one hour, and trust me, I, Diana, I know how you feel if you're back there, because even in an hour, I, I'm trying to figure out how I could get all this information in for you. And it may seem like a long time, but trust me, I have been going through this and cutting out and cutting out and trying to give you all, all sort of the value of the customer support in NetSuite. So as you know, uh, CRM encompasses several things. It encompasses marketing, automation, you know, the campaigns, the things you get from us that say, hey, you know, we're having a meeting. Uh, it, it encompasses Salesforce automation, which is what Dana will be doing. And then it also, the third portion of that is the customer support or when you deal with what we call cases, case support management in NetSuite. So that's what I'm gonna be covering today. My name, as Corey said, is Margie Kuminos, and most of you know me because I've been on the board for a long time. I work for PlantScan Corporation. I am the Director of Operations and the NetSuite Administrator. We've been using, or I've been using NetSuite for 17 years when it was still NetLedger, and I've been using the CRM um, module quite um, since, almost the beginning of it. I wanted to provide you all my email address. So if you have questions, follow-up questions, things that uh, you're just sort of curious about regarding CRM, uh, please don't hesitate to email me and reach out to me that way. 
So um, a few things. I wanted to ask, oh, also I wanted to mention Plants Inc. Corporation, we're a manufacturer. We don't deal with plant, plants. We deal with plant, like manufacturing plants, HVAC, things like that. So we are a manufacturing company. So when I talk about CRM and if I relate it to my company, I'd say 75% of our cases or people calling in deal with uh, repairs or calibrations or things that deal with the instruments themselves, just to give you an idea. Um, a few questions. I want to deal with Q&A today. Oh, I meant to start this. I need to start my timer because it's not easy for me to stay on task. So just hang on while I get that started. And um, I did want to find out how many of you are using CRM today and um, how many of you, I guess, so that's my first question. How many of you have implemented, been using CRM, the cu customer support portion for some time? Okay. How many of you are very new to it or just recently implemented it and are hoping to find out more information? Okay. How many of you are interested and wanted to find out more about it to see if you want to use this? Okay. And the rest of you just came for breakfast? <laughs> well, we're going to go ahead and get started. As far as Q&A, please ask. If it's a short answer, I'll answer now. But if it's going to take longer, I'll tell you we can really dig in during the open forum <laughs> session or at some later point. Um, okay. Um, oh, is there anything that you definitely wanted me to cover today in, in this portion? Was there anything that you came with a burning need to have an answer to? All right. So I am going to get started. Like I said, trying to fit all this in an hour was near impossible. So what this is not a training session. However, what I did want you all to have was information if to be able to go back to, to say, okay, we want to implement CRM. There's an area. We want to know what's required, et cetera. So to that end, I probably spent most of my time, rather than on the presentation portion, putting together an eight-page document for you all. And this will be on On our member page. And this eight page document is like what you do, like setting employees as a sales rep. So this will be on our member page by the end of this week, and hopefully, you'll find a lot of value. Um, especially if you're fairly new to it, CRM, even if you're a seasoned user, there's probably things you didn't know that um, because even putting together this presentation, I found about out about a lot of things that are a few things that I didn't know about. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is just basically what I'm going to try and cover. And we probably won't get into the last two bullet points, the case management tracking cases and what's possible, but they are in my uh, presentation that will also be posted by Friday. And basically, we have at PlantScan, I've modified, configured, created little sweet scripts, done all sorts of things to make uh, it so much more powerful than it is when it comes right out of the box. So what is support management? These are documented interactions that a company has with their customers, initiated by the customer, as opposed to a campaign that you send to customers. So this is a two-way conversation. And so basically with the company, you've got your company in the center. How do your customers communicate with you? They communicate with you via email, your website, maybe a chat now within your website, calling in. And so about a plethora of things, whether it's a how-to, whether it's a problem, whether it's a repair request or change in order, things like that. And then how does this translate into what we do in NetSuite? Basically, everything comes into what we call an internal case. An, uh, an internal case form is what our support reps do use. So these are basically everything that you saw on the previous slide and how they translate into NetSuite. Now, the one thing you should notice is this chat now. That is not native in NetSuite, but there are suite apps that I just you know, Google suite apps for chat now, and there are a few out there. So if you do want to have chat now and you want it to be incorporated um, to work nicely, play well with 
our CR, with the CRM module, then you just simply um, go out and research that. So the customer touch points. If you have an email, you might have someone that would email support at planscan.com. They might just do that directly. Or maybe they come from your website here, and in the website, they might use a contact us form, which is an online case form. And you go, well, you know, we're not using NetSuite website. That's not a problem at all. I'll show you, I'll just show you briefly that we actually do that. We just implemented a big commerce website. Most of our, most of our sales are through distributors. We OEM our product to other companies, but we also have a website. Uh, so there you can use like a native online, uh, native case form, a uh, contact us form from like big commerce, or you can actually publish your online case form from NetSuite onto whatever website you use. Then there's the, the external case form, online case form from what we call a customer center. How many people have you used customer center? Uh, your customers use customer center. Oh, wow, okay. We find tremendous value, and I don't know if it's because we have distributors, but I'll show you briefly what that looks like, and then you can see how they can submit cases uh, that way. And then finally, a lot of people call in, and if they call in, the support rep is sitting there and enters in an internal case inside um, NetSuite. So, oh, sorry. All right. So let's go on over here, and I wanted to show you a couple things. Um, uh, I said that you could actually, oh, and then once you have a case, once something is in NetSuite, the way that the information gets back out to the customer to continue communicating is via an email. And that email is a direct email, or it also you know, has information in it, also it has a link, so the, cust the customer or prospect can then update the case via the link or reply to the email. So this here, what I wanted to show in PlantScan, so this is a big commerce website. And you can see that I can go to the Contact Us form, and they can fill this information out. This translates, since this is part of big commerce, this translates directly into an email that gets sent to us. If I go into a service request, however, this actually brings up an online case form that was created in NetSuite. But it looks like it's just part of the website that we've um, implemented in big commerce. And then I wanted to show, um, I mentioned the external case forms or online case forms. This is the customer center. So all our distributors have a customer center that they can go to where they can see, they can enter orders, they can see their orders, they can see their support cases that they've entered and track them, or they can actually go in and create a case and contact us that way and submit this, and that gets translated into an internal case form. So uh, what I wanted to show now is, let's see if I can find it, okay. Over here, in the case update, this is like a, what a customer would see. This is, they submitted a case, they basically said, you know, this is a, you know, a, test and then the reply to it is this is sort of the information that the person responds to the support rep and then they can click on that link to actually update the case information so those are the two ways that a customer can respond and it's important that you understand I just wanted you to know the options for them because it impacts how you set up your set preferences and I'm going to give you some tips toward the end of this <clears throat> Uh, okay, so moving over to here, we're going to, oh, I did want to show you, once you have all these cases in NetSuite, so they're all in your system for your company, how does a, how does a, how does the company actually see that? How do the different groups? So if we look here, and we go to list support cases,
you'll notice that you have, um, let me change this to the, that's our view. Let me change this to the default view. This is how, these are basically the cues. So this is the cues. You notice that there's a lot of information. This is sort of the default one. You can modify it. And you notice this grab button. I'm not going to talk about that now, but I just want you to be aware of it so you can grab a case. And what's interesting here is you can see that it's already assigned to something, yet you can still grab it. Grabbing it means that you actually get it, you assign it to yourself. So you might have different cues basically saying this is, this is the product queue. These are the support reps that uh, support the products. These are general inquiry. This is the queues. These are the people that support those and can answer questions like what's your return policy, things like that. Can you assign those automatically? Yes, you can. And we'll be, thank you. We'll be covering that in something called rules and territories. And that's one of the areas I'm going to uh, sort of uh, focus on. So I just tried to pick areas that are the most confusing or a little bit more complex or had the most questions when either I implemented it or other people implemented the CRM portion. So now looking at a case, we're going to start taking a look and drilling into the anatomy of a case. Not going into every field, there just isn't time. So I'm going to go into those areas, as I just mentioned, that, that require some more explanation. But if you have a question about a specific field, please ask. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that you get, this is the default form that you get with NetSuite. It's optional if you want to change it and modify it. Highly recommend it. Why? Because there's going to be fields here that you want to hide. There's going to be fields, custom fields that you want to add. There's going to be things that you want to move around. Uh, there's going to be like here it's got item well what if you don't sell a product you know do you really need to see do you really need to have this field there wouldn't be anything there so um there's uh some of the things that i do highly recommend one of the things that really you need to do two things you might want to hide custom form because if you have many different forms so we have different forms based on different distributors because they need to see different information so if you have many different forms, you just don't have one, then you want to, whatever form was used to create that um, case, you might want to make sure that everybody else touching that case sees the same one rather than the performer form. So all you would do is you, this is, I'm not going to be going into a lot here, but if you want to customize, you, you right from here, you can add a field, you customize the form. And you need to check this one box that says store form with record. I think that's what it is. Let's see, it's a little slow in bringing it up. Um, do, 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 okay, so this store form with record. That means anybody else looking at that form will see the way it was originally created. Maybe you want this, maybe you don't. Maybe it comes into an original queue and you it's just sort of specific information and then it goes to a product person that needs to get more information from the customer so but that is very powerful additionally form is preferred means that this is going to be the default form i'm not saying to use that on this i'm just saying those two fields are important and you can move elements between sub tabs you can move elements around you hide you can make things mandatory all sorts of options with that so going back to this case the next thing that i want to talk about is, um, oh, this, this was a little confusing to me in the beginning because they, it wasn't originally back in 2002 when I implemented this, this, this capability wasn't there and I'm not sure when it came about. It used to be that you had a, you put in a company and it populated the email that was on the customer record. So now, um, basically, if I change this like to another company, Notice how the email changed. It changed to the primary email that's on the customer record, but you're going, oh gosh, I'm not dealing with the company. I'm dealing with people within the company. At least that's how we deal with it. You may be dealing with individuals, but what you can actually do is if you select a contact 
within that company, notice how the email automatically changes. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, and and we, use, we use that quite a bit. Otherwise, you're sending your, your information back to the wrong person. So you might want to make contact a required field. The uh, next thing that I wanted to talk about here was a profile. You can see I've got three. That's because to some people, to our vendors, we are radiolics. Uh, that was the name the company was originally. So try and spell that, Radiolic. And does it really mean anything? So we have a DBA of Plant Scan Corporation. And when we sell, that's what we sell under Plant Scan Corporation. So depending if we're dealing with a vendor, if we're dealing with a, um, a distributor or a customer, we have different profiles. Profiles came out in 2014.1. Prior to that, there was nothing called profiles. In the set preferences, you would just say, these are the emails that we want to use to respond to our customers. These are the, um, this is, so this is the email we want, these are the templates. These are, this is the email we want to respond to them. And this is the name we want it to come from. But this allows branding now. So now at 2014.1, you can have these profiles and if you are using one world anybody here using one world this is really key because this is what the subsidiaries all use profiles and i think that's probably the the reason why that they went to this and if you implemented before 2014.1 when you upgraded or when you when they upgraded you to 2014.1 they took your default you know what you had in the set preferences and they actually created a default pre um, a default profile for you. So all that information unbeknownst to you was just copied over. So what is this profile? What's in it? So let's go ahead and take a look. So we're going to go into Setup Manager, which I highly recommend doing everything in when you're setting up support or any, you know anything, whether you're setting up marketing. Can you see that or is that kind of hidden? I don't know. What, okay. So if we go into support, these are going to be a number of the tasks you're doing. Oh, Gosh, darn it. I need to increase the size of this. You probably can't see this very well. So let me do that at this point. And let me go into support. Tell me if you can see everything or if you need me to enlarge the screen. I'm going to go into my default one. Can you all see that well now? Can you see it better? Okay, all right. All right, so what is here? What are you seeing? You're seeing the name of the profile, which is plan scan. You're seeing that any email from plan scan, the email address that it's gonna come from is this email address that I set up in this profile. This is a capture and this is using um, a native contact us form from another website or people are just saying support at netsuite.com because what this does is this actually takes in your email server you would take this and if I edit this this is nothing that you can create it generates it for you you take this, put it into your email server, and basically say, I want to forward anything that goes to PlantScan support at, at uh, PlantScan.com to go to forward to this address. And when it does that, it's actually going to come into NetSuite into it. So that's sort of the link there. The, um, let's go back over here. The notifications is basically what are the email templates that we're going to use to communicate with the customer on case creation, on update, on automatic closure, or the employee that receives the case, receives the update. Um, the, if you click on this copy employee,
notes for an update. This is these are the various messages for branding. Or if you just have one company, one look, you're not using subsidiaries, it it's um, just one place you do do it now instead of in set preferences. Okay. All right. The next thing I want to talk about was um, going back to our case. This is something you could assign automatically. Yes, um, you can. And this is how you do it. Not this is how you do it. I want to bring up a point before I show you how to do it. Notice that for my support, I have a list of people named here. Okay, well, we have more employees than that. So how is it that, plus it's kind of weird. I see my name here, but then I see something that says AEM support. Well, that's not a person. I see RAD support. That's not a person. So what's going on here? The first thing is that you can assign a case to a person or you can assign a case to a group. To me, the group is a queue. So once it's in that queue, those people that are assigned to that queue can grab that case or it can be assigned to an individual person. And if you, you know, just have a one person at your company doing support or just a couple. So the, the, uh, the queue is actually created by going to uh, list relationships groups and in that that is it so you create a group it can be a static group it can be a dynamic group but if I look at this one here you can see that there's like two people in this queue so that means when a case is, is created um, or an update comes through multiple people get contacted about that update if I just put an individual, only that individual is notified about that update. You have a new employee, maybe you want to make it a queue so the manager also always gets updates to make sure that the, the new employee is, is uh, working on the case properly. Mark, do you have a question? If you have a case that's assigned to a group and somebody grabs that, do they have to be part of that group to be able to grab it? That's a good question. I don't know. Okay. Um, you don't. You do not. You don't. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You do not. Someone answered the question. The question was, if anybody could, you know, if you had to be a member of that group to grab the case, and the answer came from another member here that said, no, you don't. I steal cases all the time. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> However, we actually have a safe search set up. So you only see the case cases that are in your queue. So we have so now what I want to show is how you actually set up those rules in what how things should be assigned. So in other words, we have a specific product, a contract manufacturer, we own all the parts, we've trained them how to build our instruments, and they do repairs on certain instruments. <laughs> Meanwhile, at our facility, we build the high-end products and we repair them ourselves. And additionally, anything that's any calibrations that come in that needs NIST certifications, they come into ours and we do that. So if I look here as far as the rules, how you actually set that up, you go into case rules, case rules and territories work together. So let me go into uh, case rules first. Case of rules that you group together that determines who gets assigned, whether it's an individual. Oh, how how did you see those people in the in the drop down to show those on your employee record under HR? You need to have support rep check. So that's key there, manager. So these are a number of rules that we have here. So basically, if I take a look at this, this VPX product match. It's, all it's basically saying is, 
if the product is a BPEX, a specific product, okay, sorry for the slowness here. Okay, basically it's saying, uh, this is the name of my rule. Usually I put it in the description. If it contains, the product name contains the word BPX in it, and then um, you could have sub criteria and all. It's just a very simple rule I have there. Um, then if I look at another rule, such as uh, calibration, basically it's saying if someone comes in and they want a calibration done on their, on their product, if it comes in and the case issue, this is where types and issues, and I'm not going into today because if you're using CRM, you're very familiar with them. If it's a calibration, that's another rule. So there's no assignment here. The assignment comes in where you go into territories. So here, this is a subset. I mean, these aren't the rules, they're a territory, and basically it's saying, okay, who gets assigned, who gets assigned uh, an instrument that's going to be sent to Radiolics, which is our facility. It's those, it's those customers that say they have a, a product repair that's a VPX, and they checked in their case form that they're sending the instrument to Radiolics. So then it's assigned to RAD support. So that's how it's assigned to the queue. You could have just as easily assigned it to an individual. The, um, you know, basically, if it's a calibration, you can see that once again, if it comes in and it's a calibration, that's the only rule in this. You could have multiple rules. It goes to RAD support. So that sort of gives you a brief overview of how that works. Then if you want to uh, list these, the rules, you can see how, excuse me, uh, you can see territory reason. You can see how you can have these listed here and you can actually say which comes first. There's always the, the last one is the default round robin that comes in. And the case territories, that's the list. So notice the difference. If I say list, you see these and I can go in and say, oh, this one goes first. I can edit it. But this is not a good way to edit it. What you basically want to do is you want to go into territory, case territories, don't select list, then you can just click and drag the order of how those rules are applied. Because once the rule meets a criteria, it doesn't process any of the others. Kind of like an outlook, you know how you can create rules and once the rule is, you, you can stop and it won't process any others. So order does make a difference. Are there any questions on that? Because I know that's a little bit complex and I kind of just went over it briefly. By the way, in the last, in the presentation and also in the last page of this document, the ninth page, I actually kind of have a little flow here, an example that I took from the NetSuite website that will kind of explain how it processes those rules and assigns those territories. All right. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, um, oh yeah, going back to the case. How many of here sell products where they offer support on their products? Anybody? Okay, there's a few. So you might want to have them put in the item. You know, what, what item is this, what are they looking for for support? So if you click the down arrow on this, the pull down arrow, you can see that there's a number of products that are listed. Well, this is just a subset of our products. These aren't the raw materials, this isn't everything else. So how do you get things to show up on that? And not only here in the internal case form, if you have an online case form and you show item, it shows up there too. So even if I'm in a big commerce website or if I'm in a NetSuite website, if you click on that down arrow, it will have those. So the way you do that is you go into an item. So here I've got one of our, um, an item sound burster that was on that list. And you go to the preferences tab and you check offer support. So that's how that shows up there. Okay, the next topic area that I wanted to cover, let me see how I'm doing with time. Okay, a little more than half, but almost halfway there. I wanted to talk about this, um, 
when you actually submit something. So the customer types comes, you know, they say, oh, well, we want information on your return policy. So it's like, okay, so I'm a support rep. So I got to go out, find our return policy, cut and paste. Well, that's a lot of time wasted. Invitation for errors. So what you want to do is you want to use something called solutions, topics and solutions to make life easier, make your support reps more productive. So if I were just to type in here, return, notice how, because I only have one thing, because this was for a test, you know, for, for today, it brings in the return policy. And so then I could just simply send that to the customer. Or if I pull on this pull down arrow, I can see all my, oops, excuse me. I'm not sure where that went. Okay, I'm trying to, yeah. So I can see all of my solutions or I can narrow it down by like general questions. And then I would see that there's, um, you know, what is the return policy? For us, most of ours are based on repairs and such. So if I go to here and I narrow it down on a, a specific type of instrument, a VP 1000, 2000, you can see that there's a number of solutions. We actually bill for repairs. So in my solution, this is the, the topic of, um, or the summary of it. So this is usually where, what they're calling in on. This is usually like, what, what is the question? So for the other one, it would have said return policy. But for this, it's like, okay, it's a, um, it's a you know, calibration, it's a specific instrument, it's a vibration sensor assembly. So I'd pull that in and automatically the sales rep would know the price of what to charge for that. So they would send this reply and say, and they would get that. And it's the answer is, so basically the problem was a, a bad vibration sensor assembly. The answer was replace it. The cost is $160. So um, just digging into a little bit more of this, I wanted to show you how this is set up. This is not in the setup manager. This is actually because um, employees, you don't need to be an administrator or have special rights for this. As long as you have the support rights, you can go ahead and create topics and solutions. So I'm going to bring this up real quickly here. So first you would want to have a topic that all your solutions are going to be placed under. Then you're going to have your solutions. So I want to explain the value of this, these solutions. They make a consistent response from the company, whether it be rather, rather than being from a support rep. And you can add, if you're in a case, you can actually add a new solution. It won't be approved unless you have the right permissions like your support manager. So um, here I can see that for this instrument, if I filter that, I have that by instruments, I can see the topic is VP 1000, 2000. So each of these solutions was created underneath a topic. So you create your topics and then you apply them to solutions. And the cool thing is you can have a solution applied to more than one topic. So if you have, if you have like um, something, a repair that's done to multiple instruments in our case, I can apply that same solution to a VPE and to a VPE 1000. So if I look here, um, I can see that the vibration sensor assembly is here. Notice here the case count on the right. So if you're doing product repair, this is so key. And even if you're not, if you're just getting a lot of questions and they're the same questions over and over and you're using the same solution, people can start looking at this and doing analysis and going, wow, maybe we're not making that clear. Maybe we need to modify our website and make that information clearer so people don't have to call in a case, you know, open up a case. So you can see here that um, for this, uh, this vibration sensor assembly, that there were uh, um, 32 repairs on that. And you're going, wow, well, if that was 32 repairs in a month, I'd be worried. But if I actually drill into this, 
So from here, you can drill in to the solution, and then you can see all the cases that are actually attached to the solution. So here you can see all the cases, and you can see these cases go back, this is the first 25, and they go back to 2008. So really, that's not so bad. So going back to the details of this topic, this is where, oh, and notice that parts thing in there, that was a customization we did. So not only do we want the, um, uh, this, this is custom, so it's not there. We, we say, well, what's required in that repair? What's the part? Because we actually have it customized where from, you can do an inventory adjustment right from the case, create an inventory adjustment record that's attached to the case, and it actually takes it right out of inventory right there and then. So um, this tells them what parts they need to put into the inventory adjustment. <laughs> So the, the code is automatically generated, or you could decide to put in your own code. The title you put in, it's searchable. The status, whether it's approved or not, and then the abstract is also searchable. That's sort of the summary. What is the problem? The problem was a vibration sensor assembly was broken. And the description here, which can also accept HTML, is the solution. So um, are there any questions about that? It's incredibly powerful. Who is using that today? Okay, you are. Anybody think they'll want to use it after today? Okay, at least one person. Great. Oh, you have a question. You don't want to use yes. it. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Going back when you were showing to assign uh, support reps, uh -huh. can, you, can you assign multiples like sales rep and support rep? Well, yes, you could do that through a group. Okay. You could have a an individual sales rep. You can, can, that, can you have okay? You can check all of them. Thank you. Oh, right. Because on that record, the employee record, which I don't have, I do have up, you can say whether it's a sales rep or a support rep. So if you collect, uh, check the sales rep, um, you know, then but they could be both, is what you Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You could be both. Sorry, that's not a, it's not a radio button, it's a checkbox. However, on the case form, there's actually a checkbox that acts more like a radio button. So, uh, just to confuse you. So, going back, let me check my time. Okay, getting there. A um, few other things I wanted to show on here. Okay, uh, I wanted to show the escalations. Oh, on the emails. Say you have a customer that calls in and says, well, you know, this is who I am, but I also need my manager or somebody else to be aware of this, this uh, case and what's going on. How do you do that? It's just one email that's showing. You simply just put a comma and then the a comma and then the next email address. And you can, I don't know if there's a limit, but you can put several of them. So that's where the customer is. So the next thing I wanted to show was the, the I'm going to go back to the communication because that is like really key here and the various ways you can communicate. But I um, wanted to show that there's a few other things you can do here. If I go into related records, it shows the solutions. Also, and I'm not sure when this came out, you can actually attach and create transactions that are attached to the cases directly from the case records. So you can do an estimate of sales order, all of these that you see listed here. Now that's pretty powerful. And then finally over here, I wanted to show escalation. So what is an escalation and how is that different than just doing it, being in the interactions? The escalations allows you to say, oh, hey, we've got a, a you know, maybe a challenge with this, a problem with this, or maybe even you want to have it escalated so you can have other people always contact it because maybe you want, you are having, um, a, there's a problem with the customer and guess what? You want the sales rep to know about that problem. You want to know everything that's going on with that case. So you can escalate that. This is, you put in the escalation, you put in the a message there. It ends up as an internal message that shows up on the interactions tab, which I'll show you soon. And then you say, who do you want to escalate to? Now, I don't know if anyone uses this, but it is broken in our account. Support does not know how to fix it. If I select employee, it doesn't change my list. If I select the vendor, it doesn't change my list. I don't know, does it work for anybody? I don't use it that way. So. Oh, okay. Does it change the search results though? If you search for something, it 
No, I tried that too. That does not work. No, it's just broken. They don't know why. Excuse me. So um, the next thing that I wanted to focus on is coming into this interactions. Yes. Good question on our previous. You, you said you showed us uh, transactions tied to a case. Yes. Uh, if you create a new transaction from the case, how much how much of the information from the case is in is defaulted into the new transaction? It didn't look like really any when I went to it and tried that myself. Thank you. So, um, but it is attached. So when you go back to the case, you will still see the attached transaction. So it's sort of a you know parent child relationship. Um, what I wanted to talk about here in the communications tab is something that will impact, uh, we'll talk about more in set preferences, and then also here. Notice here, I have replies set to internal only as the default. I uncheck that. You have to uncheck that and then check send to customer. So um, it can't be both, but it doesn't matter because if it's sending to the customer, you're going to still see it internally. So reason why we have a default and that's in the set preferences to internal only is because we deal with our contract manufacturer we might be sending messages to the sales rep um, that's you know that works with that customer we might be going you know um, interacting with the manager at the group someone with in engineering so we don't want to accidentally send internal messages to the customer so we have set uh, do you have set internal only and then, um, but you're going, well, gosh, what if I forget? And you know what? If you forget and you're sending something to a customer, they're not going to get it. But what we've done is we have a three line suite script. It's not a, you can't do this in a, in a workflow, unfortunately. It should be, it should be really simple. But we have based on status. So when the case type is, um, the status type is, uh, we we want to send something to a customer. We've moved these all around, so it looks different than ours. But we want a request. We're waiting on the customer to respond. When we say request for response, then we automatically have a, a suite script that will change this from internal, uncheck internal, and say and check send to customer. I don't know if you do that too. Okay. So it's three lines. If anybody wants it, just email me, and I'd be happy to to get that to you. The other thing I wanted to show you here is this, copy employees. Notice here I have something, employees in our, co in our company, but I've also set up a vendor as an employee because our contract manufacturer, they don't want to get into NetSuite. They just want to, if I have a question, they just want me to email them, but I want it in the case record. So basically all I do is I select um, a, the vendor and it's, I make sure it's internal only and it treats, so I've set up a vendor as an employee. And because of that, I can now check this um, box and they'll get the message and it'll be tracked in the case. The only thing, the only caveat is when you, you, you should modify your employee template so they don't see the history to the customer. So all you do, and I have a slide in the presentation, I'm not going to show you now, there's, a, there's like a line that says message history. You just remove that from the template and therefore you're just asking a question. So then, so as I mentioned before, or maybe I didn't, this is how the customer information comes in over here and your replies are over here. So you're going, well, that's really interesting. I'm trying to figure out, you know, why in the world I can actually go over here and see this messages. Oh, you can't see it, shoot, let me, shrink this a little so, you, so that's not in the way. It says messages and I can email from here. Oh my gosh, well, how do I know which one I wanna use? Do I wanna email from there? Do I wanna email from over here? We, we mostly just do it from here. Or do I wanna email from here? Oh, that's a little confusing, what do I do? So the thing that you need to be aware of is there are some differences. If you reply from here, this is what we use most of the time. You can interact with your employees and such, but there are some benefits to replying from the email here to the customer. And what you can do is you can actually um, 
send to additional recipients, maybe in the company, that you want blind copy. If you use it from this regular, from the reply area here, and you copy an employee, the customer is going to get that employee's email address, and you might not want that. So over here, you can also <coughs> send attachments. So if you want to send an attachment to a customer, this is the way you do it. And then finally, I wanted to show on this message, uh, on this 15 more minutes, Whew, sorry. <coughs> and if I'm talking fast, you can just slow it down when you replay this, when you go online. So notice that there's two addresses here, and you're going like, what? How come there are two addresses? I don't understand. This one here comes from the profile. This one here comes from your company setup where you say that you want the email reply address to be this. So you can choose when you're sending from, a, from the message form where you want it from. And you can also choose like a template if you want to send replies, on, if you want to use this method versus the other reply. Um, so that is another way to reply to the customer. And plus, it's a lot easier with the formatting, a lot more formatting options here than in here. So um, let's see. Uh, oh, with that profile, I forgot to mention, how do you set that profile? You set a default profile, but if you use an online case form, going back when I was speaking about profiles before, <coughs> If you have an online case form that you publish to your website, you can actually set the profile in that online case form. So that is a, a method for setting the profile. Or you could write a suite script or you could do a workflow too for sending that. And the other way is you set up multiple support email addresses. And then if um, something, you have a contact us form and it generates an email, you could have it going to the different brand companies that you've branded or your different subsidiaries. All right. Um, I think I've covered all that. Oh, good. I'm on time. So the next thing, oh, wait, I did want to show this. <laughs> Sorry. Remember, this is volunteer work. So this is done outside of, outside of company hours. So um, notice that the messages, I didn't really show you what does it look like in the queue. So notice these messages. It's like, whoa, that's really a lot to get through. That's because the customer, the customer or the prospect or whatever would reply to an email. And that reply to the email brings all the history to it. So every time you send them a message, and, and if you, as a support rep, use your email, you send them a message, and they send a message back, pretty soon it starts looking really bad. And then your customers are getting this. So if you look at this, where I look at more, this was an email that was sent to a customer. Start taking a look. It's embedded, 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 and it just keeps propagating. So there's ways in set preferences to kind of reduce that, and I'll be showing that in just a minute. Meanwhile, what, a, what it should look like, let me see, I think I have another case up here. Uh, oh, over here. This is a nice one. This is what it really should look like. You know, you, you've got your, you, your, if it's a repeat customer, you've got them trained to click on that link rather than reply to the email. You've, um, and you can see clearly exactly what's going on, what the message was, et cetera. You can see here, this was one that was actually sent to our uh, contract manufacturer. And so it says email sent no but it actually was sent. It was just the email wasn't sent to a customer. They did receive an email. It says internal only. You, and if you accidentally sent something to a customer, uh, well, you can change it from, in, from you know, uh, internal only no to yes. So you can actually change that at that time. So that's what, uh, that's what it looks like when it plays in that, when everything works as you think it would be. And you can see all of the messages, all the interactions, whether it came from the customer or whether it was an internal one here. 
So I wanted to show that and sort of the difference in what can happen if you allow support reps to also reply to emails versus forcing them to go to cases. Uh, and then the one other thing I wanted to show you here that I hadn't showed you before in this case is this is, if, you, if we use the default contact us form from Big Commerce, this is what it comes in like. It comes in as, as this, uh, you know, this was a test, Winter Park, dot, you know, dot, whatever, Winter Park Fun, which is my, I like Winter Park, I ski there a lot, so that's my personal, one of my personal emails. And it's sent, uh, <laughs> sent to, um, it, the inbound email address was support at plantscan.com. And it actually had that long NetSuite address that I showed you earlier on the profile. And it comes in with all the information here. So I guess you could have a suite script or something that breaks that up and puts that into a case. But if you use an online case form in BigCommerce, it looks just like a normal case and it's beautiful. So I highly recommend that, that approach. All right, so let me close some of these windows. Um, and at this point, I want to go over to my set preferences and talk about a few key things that are that you will want to use. So I go into here. We're back at our setup manager, which I said is the best place to be. You open your support. You go into set preferences. And the first thing I want to go to is the notification tab. These are some key things that no that all of you should consider doing. This is saying who gets notified when a case is assigned, who gets notified when the case is updated, who gets notified when the case is escalated. And these are internally. So you want to check notify assignees. That way they'll receive an email when a new case has been assigned to them. Or maybe you don't. For us, we do, because I want to know in my email, then I just go into my, I, I'm not, a, I'm, my dedicated job is not support. So I'm not always in that support queue. So I want to be notified when a case is, comes in, or I want to be notified when it's updated. Now, if I update the case, I'm not going to get another email saying, oh, it's been updated. That would, that would not be logical. But if there were multiple people assigned to the case, they would get an update when I update the case. And then what I do is, this is really key, send notification replies <coughs> to customer. If you check that, which you, I say do not check it, you are saying the support rep can actually respond in the email. You do not want to do this. This support email customer reply update. You do not want them to be able to reply in the case. You're going to start seeing those propagations. You want to force your support reps to go over and, and do that from the queue, from the online queue that I showed you earlier, or go directly into the case. The next thing I wanted to show is under general. And this under the general tab, this plays with this. Receive customer replies and case list only. Now, this is a little bit confusing because this says that your, if you clear this box, the customer communication is sent directly to the assigned support rep, allowing them to reply directly to the customer through the case record. So basically what I'm saying here by checking that box is that they can't reply to an email in an email. They can only reply in the case list. And this plays together with this other tab over here. So let's say that this wasn't checked. And let's say that a, a customer comes in and they say, they reply and I get an update notification because I've checked that box and say update notification. And then I also checked the box that said, Send notification reply. Oh, this is sending notification replies to the customer. Oh, and then I've also checked this box. Yeah. 
Oh, what I recommend is unchecking these and checking in that uh, general tab that other, the one that says um, receive customer replies in case list only, because we do not want the support reps to be able to reply in the case itself. So it's a little bit confusing. I have it described in more depth in the presentation. So hopefully you will understand that. But there might be times maybe you want your support reps to be able to reply from the email. So it kind of depends on your environment and your situation. Okay. So um, let me see if there was some other. Oh, yes. There's another tab over here that's um, inbound email. This, don't get confused by it because you're going, well, I've got one of these in my profile. The default profile in this will use the same one. I mean, they're, they're different, but they go to the same place. It's, this is just really a leftover for people that set it up before 2014.1. And so, you don't, so people like me did not have to go in and update their email server. The ordering tab is really key because here, if you go into a case, uh, a case type, and you want to reorder these, I have to go into each one and edit it and say, oh, insert before. And I can be like, okay, which one goes first? Which one goes last? But right in the set preferences, you can actually order using drag and drop your case statuses, your case priorities, your case types, your origins, and your case issues. So this is, if you need to rearrange, this is how you do it. Uh, this is what way I'd recommend doing it, rather than trying to figure out what order you want it in from the list of the cases and st uh, the statuses and all. All right, and then the next thing I wanted to show, uh, talk about was tracking cases. I'm not gonna really go into it, because we just have a couple minutes. We have like four minutes. Um, but basically you can, from a customer tab, you can see all the cases assigned to it. From a, um, uh, let's see, from a vendor, you can see all the cases. There's a case tab, so you can see all their cases. We saw it from the solutions. We saw it, the list, the grab. Oh, right, I wanted to tell you about this. So. The grab, um, I just wanted to reiterate, because I mentioned it briefly before, even though this is already assigned, this is already assigned to a, um, a group, it wasn't assigned to an individual. So this is where I can grab it, that we talked about earlier. Um, I wanted to show you what we, we have real quickly, um, because we've actually made it so that We've put in some customization, parent-child <coughs> records. So we have an invoice, and on our invoice, we actually attach, so let me bring this up real quickly, just to see, so you can see what's possible. We attach, from our invoice, we attach the cases. And on the bill from our contract manufacturer, if they're doing the repair, we attach the cases. So if I go into this um, case here, you can see I've got a bill, I've got an invoice, and I've got an inventory adjustment. Because if I go into this case and if I were to edit it, I put in a button that said inventory adjustment. Because we also charge for most of our cases, I removed the button that said close and submit. So when the customer can't do that, and neither can our internal uh, support, it has to be done by a manager. Um, so here I wanted to show you on a bill from our contract manufacturer, there's the cases that are listed, that are attached to it, and likewise from the invoice, there are cases that are attached to it. And once I go back to my case list, that's how we know that something can be closed. 
So once there is an invoice, once we've invoiced, come on, hello, wake up. Once we've invoiced and we see that there, we don't necessarily get a bill from a, uh, the contract manufacturer. Once I know we've invoiced for it, then I know I can go over and close it. So um, I just wanted to show that real briefly. Uh, let's see, is there anyone here that has some questions? I know I'm just about out of time, but yes? We use that inbound case capture, email case capture, and we have issues where the customer will send it to email, we've provided them with support ad, and then they'll copy two people at their company, two people at our company. So then, of course, if somebody else doesn't reply all, it creates another case in our system. Do oh. you have that issue, and how do you deal with it? We do not have that issue. Oh, how do you train them? <laughs> yeah, there is the ability to merge cases. So they reply directly from the email. Yep. Is there? Good. Well, it can be somebody at their company, so they've copied a couple people, and somebody else wants to chime in, and they want somebody out in the field and they're remote, so they just reply. To the Okay. So that's the one thing that has, has delayed or um, restricted some of our groups into the use of the case creation. So we'll take it from email. You see the sales force moving the office to use the way for everybody in the company. Yes. But then they start their sales conversations. Yes. <laughs> and you get that in the case. Oh, yes. we get it. Yes. So the oh, question. Multiple cases. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Each reply does a, does a new case. Oh my gosh, yeah. no. So the problem uh, for those that are remotely attending is that uh, the question was, how do you deal with when you send, uh, when you, a case is originally opened and then the customer gets an email and then they respond to the email copying other people and then they respond and it generates multiple cases. I can tell you a way around that is if you use, hadn't used the customer center. Right, and we don't use Okay, now the customers, you don't have to have a website, you don't have to have e-commerce or anything to use customer center. Uh, maybe you have too many customers or, because we have mostly just distributors and, um, but we found that very beneficial because our distributors do not reply to the emails, they go right into there. Uh, um, I guess you could probably, I imagine Mike would have a solution with a sweet script. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, all right, well, I, any other questions? Because I know I've, I'm out of time. If you want to dig into anything deeper, we can go over that during, uh, we can dig in during the open forum session. I thank you for your time. I hope you found some value, and I hope you will uh, find some value in the presentation that we posted and in this document that details everything, and it's got little tips and tricks in there. Um, so that's it. I think we have Dana Larson that's going to be coming up here now to talk about SFA, Salesforce Automation. Thank you. Let's take a five-minute break while we transition from Margie to Dana. There's more coffee and fruit and giggles. Oh, yeah. Is that one on? No, that's all.
<laughs> oh, you turned it off. <laughs> you saved me from myself. Yeah, it is. is it on now? I will go and turn it off. Okay. So you'll have to tap it. I'll have to tap it. Yeah, you have to dump that so I know when. Yeah. But I'll go. Okay, you can. I think we'll get started. How long are you going for? Half hour ish. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to end at 11 15. Are we behind? A little bit? I honestly don't know. Okay. So, right. Okay. Thanks for shutting it off. <laughs> yeah, he's going to turn the mic on when I want it to work. I just was rushing to stop you before you went somewhere. Like the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now it's. I'm sorry, I'm still blushing from having the mic on. I did not go to the bathroom. Let's just be clear about that. I was filling the water thing. I have a witness. I put this in my pocket. It was turned off. That could have gone so many ways wrong. And so really, I'm feeling pretty con you know, good about that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, hi, I'm Dana Larson with I Bailey. I work with our support organization, so we want to make sure that our clients who have NetSuite are making the most out of NetSuite, getting the most out of their investment. And so we do, we use case management in NetSuite, so that was great to see Margie's presentation. And thanks, Margie. I just want to give a shout out because she's got twin daughters who are graduating, and if you remember graduating season, May is the worst month. And then of course we have her do a presentation and it's like her whole life, she's been super busy. And so for her to do that much work for prep for this as a volunteer, I just wanna thank her for that. So thank you, Margie. That was a really good presentation. Um, I thought I'd start really all the way at the top with, because as Margie said, there's different parts of CRM. We're gonna talk a little bit today. We just have a half hour, so this is gonna be really quick. It's gonna be a drive-by, okay? And you're gonna see a few things and then you can say, wait, I wanna know more about that. And then you can go look it up in Sweet Answers or we can have a more in-depth one at another time if you feel like it's worthwhile. But I thought I'd start with the general overview. That's the way my brain works is give me the high level picture and then we're gonna drill down. And um, I had a good question during the break about um, a case. Is it a is it a lead, or is it a case? What you know? What is a case when you set it up? So there's two different types. I don't have it on here, but a case is really a transaction. The way NetSuite considers it, there's a whole case table that has all the cases. Where a lead is an entity. Okay, so in NetSuite, I think of entities, I, I joke, I was a literature major, they're the nouns in the system, they're the people, places, things, right? Where transactions are more the verbs, the things that happen between the entities. And so a lead is an entity, it's like a pre-customer, right? So it uses a very similar table, and, and I'm old enough, to I can still call it a Rolodex. It's in the Rolodex, right? It's a different color. It's a, it's a different color uh, page, uh, card in the Rolodex. So then a lead can turn into a prospect, can turn into a customer, all right? And it uses the same data as it does that. It's actually, I think, technically not the same Rolodex in NetSuite. I thought it was just put a different flag on it. I think they moved the data, but it, regardless, it's the same entity. There's a lead prospect customer. Transactions, when you have a lead, you can't have a transaction on it because that would turn it into a prospect. The minute you put a transaction, like an opportunity, an estimate, a quote, it turns a lead into a prospect because it says, hey, you're trying to sell them something. Let's call them a prospect now. Then once you turn that opportunity estimate quote into a sales order or an invoice, it turns them into a customer automatically. So the system moves them through these uh, this trail basically as you work them in your sales process they become something different and so if you see leads in your system they don't have transactions prospects have transactions but nothing closed once it's closed it becomes a customer and then just for extra credit I have the GL debit and credit on there because uh, I pulled this slide from our accounting transaction 
um, because it is interesting to know that really even all the way to the sales order, there's no general ledger activity for any of these. So you're not gonna see anything about them until you get to the invoice and then you've got AR and revenue. So does that, so cases similar to this, they come in as a transaction and essentially it's a customer. If it's got a case, it's a customer on it. And I think I'm right on that. Anybody know if differently? Okay. Any questions about the whole entity transaction, kind of how that moves through? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because of the, the lead goes away. That's why I consider it the same Rolodex. It's like you change the color of the card from the lead to prospect to customer. It's all the same card. You wouldn't have a lead at the same time as a customer. You could have a um, leads can be people or companies. And so you could have a lead come in that you've already got the customer record in there for the company and they're just a new lead at that company. Um, so it gets a little bit complicated with contacts because a contact is an individual, a company is a, is a company record in NetSuite. You can have contacts attached to companies, but you can also have a contact attached to a lead. And sometimes it's goofy because the lead is a person, right? And, and so is the contact. Depending on how you have it set up in NetSuite, when you, when you have an online lead form, when it comes in, it can set up the person as a lead and a contact at the same time, or just a lead. You can tell the system if you want it to put contacts on everything. Um, but the, the whole idea of, of marketing automation and sales, for, sales automation like this is to help your salespeople move their, their prospects through, right? That's the whole idea of what we're talking about in this very short segment is to just talk about how do you manage that what do you call things? How, how can people have a dashboard that tells them you've got four leads you should follow up with today? You've got two opportunities you need to close, things like that. They're, they're easily built in NetSuite. And if you think about it, NetSuite is a sales organization. So um, they, I think, uh, and to Corey's point about SuiteWorld, I think they are excited about their CRM. They use it internally. So they, they're, <coughs> They're trying to fix it to make it more powerful for them. So for example, the Sweet Analytics workbook, um, when they gave that to you with the 2019.1, if you go in and look at that, the sample workbooks they have are sales related because they care about sales. They care about for internally, they want to use their own product for sales. So, so you'll see um, some effort made there. Um, so the very first thing in NetSuite is there's forecasting and there's advanced forecasting and there it's free. When you first buy NetSuite, it's just gonna give you forecasting. But if you go into enable features and check the box and I'll show you that when we go in. Quick note, I'll go through some PowerPoints that'll be available for you and then I'm gonna do the quick demo. And so we'll hop into NetSuite and see all this. So I'll kind of go through these quickly so that we can hop right into NetSuite. But I wanted you to have something that you could take with you. So advanced forecasting gives you more accuracy because you can have three categories for your forecast. They named them worst case, most likely and upside, but you can change those names. And what that means is when you're working on a deal, you can say, um, this deal is gonna close for sure. That's my worst case scenario for my month. It's certainly gonna be part of my worst case scenario versus it's most likely or it's upside, meaning it, it might not sell, It's this would be awesome some if this one sold. And these aren't probability percentages. These are which forecast do I want to include this opportunity in? And so I'll be showing you advanced forecasting today. If you don't have that on, forecasts are all built, are built by the percentages of the status that you put on it. But, but what this does is it gives you one more layer to say, use the percentages and I only wanna see those, my worst case scenario for this month, what am I gonna sell? And then it's only gonna pull the opportunities that you've tagged as worst case. And like I said, they're um, cumulative. So anything that you put in worst case will definitely show in most likely an upside because you're saying it's always gonna be there. Most likely will show an upside and then upside has um, all every opportunity you have out there. So it's a cumulative stack and you'll, we'll, I'll show you that. Um, this is the, the customer statuses are really important. And this essentially is how you're driving the sales process. 
So you can have leads. You can see that when the lead comes in, um, the customer, it's called a lead, and you can actually take it through several customer statuses, and you can set these up to be whatever you want. You can rename them. There's a few that you can't. There's some uh, system assigned ones that they won't let you um, change them or delete them. So you can change the names of them, though. And so you say, I've got my lead, and my status of that lead is, is it just new? I met this person in an elevator. I don't have any idea if they have any interest in what we sell, but I'm going to put them in here because I want to track their name and number. Then later you can say, hey, they're qualified now. I looked up their company online. They're a great fit for us. They're still a lead, though, because you haven't really talked to them and done anything. Then you can move those leads through multiple phases of first call, second call, and this is all part of your sales team decides how you want to build this. But then you call them a prospect once you've put something in front of them. And so an opportunity, a quote, an estimate. And opportunities are a transaction record. I think of them as a pre-sales order, right? They're saying, I have an opportunity to sell you something. The difference is on an opportunity, you don't have to say what you're going to sell them. It can be super high level. I'm going to, they're going to spend 200,000 with me next year. You can just put a number on there where if you're selling products, you might want to do an estimate or a quote then that actually identifies exactly what you're going to sell them. And so you put those on the estimate and the quote, and, and then you're drilling down to an item level or service level. You can also do that on the opportunity. Some companies don't even use <laughs> estimates and quotes. They just put an opportunity out there. They work the opportunity. They either win it or lose it. And, and so you don't have to use estimates and quotes. But think of opportunities as more of an umbrella for I have an opportunity to sell this to this person. And then you can create five different quotes that go out and get rejected, go out and get rejected. But the opportunity is still there. The difference in forecast reporting is if you tell the forecast that you want to include your quotes, it's not going to look at the opportunity anymore, which totally makes sense because you would be doubling up your forecast right? If you've got 100,000 on your opportunity that I think we're going to sell them that, and then you give them a quote for 90, you want to use the quote that you gave them in your forecast and ignore the opportunity. But so it gives you a, a path for um, uh, following how did the sales rep interact with this prospect? What quotes or estimates did they give them? So quote and estimate is the same transaction. It's just two different words, and you can use that rename records to change that. Opportunity is different. You can, um, when you're in an opportunity, you can say, now create a quote from here, and it pulls in all the data, but it's a different transaction. So during this prospecting status, you have all kinds of, and this is where I think it's, it's you really want to pay attention as you're moving your prospects through the process you would assign a probability at each of those. So you're going to say, we're in discussion. I've got a probability here of 20%. That means that 20% of the people I talk to and get to this stage of the sale buys, 20%. And then, then as you move it through, once you get to proposal, you'll say 50% of our proposals are accepted. And, and these, are, these are stats that you can track over time. So you can really refine your sales forecast based on your past history. How have we done? If we get into a final negotiation, are we at 90% or not? And so, because that will then help you understand what you're going to sell, right? What's my, what's the probability? It's not just one of these, but it's like, no, we sell, we sell 50% of the people we talk to, we sell. So then th this is how you set that up. So you put these probabilities in, and then you basically take them to the closed one stage or lost, all right? So that's when it gets to a customer because now they're not in the sales process anymore. They're a customer, the opportunity is 100%, you, you're gonna win it. And so, um, so they, what happens is as you get leads and prospects in, some of these happen automatically in the system based on your preferences or the, the sales rep overrides it and says, I'm in proposal stage now. I'm in, you know, they pick which status they're in and it updates the probability. And then you can decide whether you want those probabilities to be updated because I might know, yeah, I'm in discussion with this client. It's still a long shot. You know, they're, even though we win 50% of our deals, I still wanna give it a 30. 
or if you're using advanced forecasting, then you just put it in the upside, right? You say it's it's a long shot. I'm probably not going to get it. So that's where you can the two cross. You can use probabilities and you can use the three categories of forecasts in order to drill in more more tightly on what you're trying to do um, and what you're trying to see. These are the preferences. Um, so when you're in NetSuite, and I, I pulled it up, but I'll just do it here. These are ba the basic things that you can change when you're talking about these sales preferences. Um, sorry, my goofy phone keeps ringing on my wall. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, so you can change the names. You can change the uh, the beginning statuses. Anytime you get a prospect or an opportunity, you can say make it the status as an as the default. Um, you can tell which lead forms to use. Um, so lead forms, when Margie was talking about case forms, that was a way to submit a case online. Lead forms are, are like a contact us on your web page. So when they click that button, they're filling out the, the lead form and it's coming into your system as a lead. And right here you tell it what, um, what status do you want the lead to be in? And so we put it in here at the new, new status. So a lead's gonna come in as new. Then over here in the forecast tab, this is where you uncheck or check if you want your calculated forecast as weighted. If you say weighted, that means it's gonna take 50% times the total opportunity, and that's how it's gonna calculate your forecast. If you're sitting at a 50%, I'm in, the, in discussions. I've had conversations with sales reps about, well, that's dumb. I'm never gonna sell half of my opportunity right it's either a yes or a no and that's where you can uncheck this weighted and just use the three categories because it's true you're not going to sell half of your opportunity and so why do you want the probability in there it totally depends on how you look at your business and if you've i would say if you do a smaller volume of sales at a high dollar amount you probably don't want them uh, weighted because then everything's gonna look like a partial sale when you're looking at your forecast, instead of just saying, is this worst case, you know, uh, most likely or upside? Where if you do a high volume of sales, you might wanna use the probabilities, percentages to help you really hone in on, yeah, this is probably going to be our sale amount. I'm sure a good sales director could shoot down what I just said because they've, they know in their mind what they want to see. So you know now that you can show it two ways, all right? And then this is how you, you do that. You can obviously change the name of that worst case, most likely upside to whatever makes sense to your sales reps. Um, use quotes in forecast, and that's what I was talking about. If you check that box, then it won't use the opportunity. It'll use any quotes that are associated with that opportunity that are still in play. Multiple projected amounts, I didn't check that box, but this gets super complicated. Now you can actually say, for my worst case forecast, I'm gonna use three amounts. For my um, medium, I'm gonna use three. For my upside, I'm gonna use three. I thought that got way too, like, it, it's three-dimensional then. It became, to me, unruly. But if your sales department really wants to get crazy with the forecast, you can click on that. And then the forecast accuracy, I like this because in NetSuite, you can run a report that says, how did my sales reps do in their forecast? Because if they're controlling the forecast of, of which category and the probabilities, you can take a point in time and say, on Friday night, we're going to go back and look at your forecast, and we're going to see if those things sold. And so, and like, how accurate were you at that close? And so if you say Friday 5 p.m., then that's when it's going to run. The weekly view is going to be Friday at 5 p.m. So then the sales reps know, oh, I've got to get all my forecasts updated, everything clean by that time. And I believe it would, yeah. So it would run on that 5 p.m. So when you see the forecast report, you'll see Friday is on these. Um, oh, allow setting status in forecast editor and probability i like that it's checked and i'll show you where that comes up because if you want your sales reps to edit their forecasts really easily by checking those they're able to do that um okay so forecasts are included if it's not been converted to a sales order cash sale or invoice the opportunity will be 
if it's been converted into a sales order, then it automatically shows in your forecast report for the month. If you're saying, I wanna see May, anything that you've sold will be in there, plus any opportunities, um, unless they have um, an estimate or quote on them. And then it looks at the date range. So date ranges are very important in the forecasting also. The process, and we've already talked a little bit, but the lead enters the system, creates an entity record, the sales rep contacts them, decides there might be an opportunity, they create an opportunity, then they include the product or total along, um, along with the stage, so the probability is assigned, or they can create the estimate or quote. So one of those will be included in the forecast. And then when the client buys and the sales rep clicks on the button in the estimate quote to create an invoice, cash sale or sales order, um, it's no longer included in the forecast. Um, the estimate quote uh, is updated to closed one, unless it's in that same month. I just realized I have that wrong because if you're talking about sales, anything you sold in that month, especially quota, I guess I should take that back. If you're looking at your quota to forecast report, it would include all of your sales because those sales needs, need to be booked against your quota. But if you're, um, if you're only looking at forecasting out in the future, then current sales wouldn't be there because it's pipeline is what you haven't sold. S sales are what you've sold. And when you're comparing to quota, you have to look at both because you're, you're basically saying, how are they doing to what we put out there for their, for their quota? Quota is like the budget that you want the sales rep to achieve if you haven't heard that word. Okay, so let's flip in to um, NetSuite real quickly here. Um, they have some, and, and oh, I'm gonna make it bigger, aren't I? Because um, I was, um, where did that go? I usually use my scroll, is it? Control five. Control plus. Control plus. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Control plus. I have to remember that one. Um, I will say I was back there. Panicking would be a little bit strong of a word, but I was stressed out because it there's something that's not working the way I thought it would work, and I've got a case into NetSuite from last week and. Of course, yeah, you know, when you do NetSuite support, they'll, um, okay, show me the screens or like, we need to do this call and I haven't been able to get on the phone. And so I'm like, just do it in any of your environments. I don't care, just pick, a, pick an environment and show me if it works there because I can't get it to work. And I'll show you in a minute what that was. But my point being, I didn't um, pretty up the dashboard as much as I wanted to, but they do have these, um, the idea if if I had a, sales team I was working with, I would want to put, you know, their opportunities and reminders. Um, I would want activities for, uh, you said you wanted to call that lead back, that would be on your dashboard. Um, an opportunity review portlet like this, where you can say, what do I have, which uh, statuses, what's my total, what's the days to close so that, and that's all running off of that projected close date. Um, um, let's see. So, but what I wanna show you, I'll quickly go, and I already showed you this, but it's in the enable features. So it's under the CRM tab is where you check the box to say advanced forecasting. So if you wanna turn on the three levels of forecasting, that's where you do it. And make sure this historical metrics is checked because that is how you can get the um, KPIs to work on your dashboard. I saw uh, someone asked a question about that on the, because I was looking in the suite answers quite a bit to figure out what was going wrong on this. Um, again, we already talked about this, but it's customer status list is under setup sales. That's where most of this stuff is, is the customer status list. And then CRM list, I just thought I'd show it to you because do you know how in the accounting, you have the, the list of accounting lists, the list of lists. This is the list of CRM lists. And when you first pull it up, you see the buying reasons, timeframes, contact roles, sales readiness, and the win-loss reasons. So this is where you control those. When they said that it's lost, you could require the field to be filled in for why did they lose it? And this is where you can come out and add new reasons, all right, and, and put, um, put them out there. Remember on these lists of lists, you can always filter. So if you only wanna look at one of them at a time, which I think is a little bit more, um, 
easier to manage because the list of lists is a little bit wild, then you can get that. Okay. Um, sales preferences, this is what I showed you before where you have the general and then the forecast themselves. Um, so this is where you control all of that. And this is where I've spent a lot of time because I couldn't get this one thing to work. And so I kept looking, are there any other places in NetSuite where you're setting up things for sales? This is all I could find. So um, I'll show you in a minute what I think is broken. Um, all right, so this is a great report. And what it allow, it's not a, it's a transaction, excuse me, it's not a report. So what you could do with your sales reps is say, hey, go out and update your forecast today. So they go into the transactions um, forecast. Uh, and this is where you establish quotas, by the way, it's a transaction type, it's not a, a list that you would say, edit your sales rep forecast. And so Mary Redding, we're looking at her forecast right now and we see her quota up here, that's pulling in from the quota. We, I did say forecast as weighted. And so what you're seeing here is the calculated forecast for the three categories, okay? And what they've done, because we're weighting it, if you look at this, this first one forecast type is omitted and uh, NetSuite in all of their environments, they automatically put omitted as the default for opportunities. So once you turn on the three types of forecasts, you have to go in and decide, do you want them to always say worst case or you know which one do you want it or omitted? You can tell them this deal is so bad, I don't even want you to include it in the forecast. So what's nice from this screen is they can go in and change the forecast type of all of their opportunities they can change the expected close date, the status, they can override the probability, and then they can see what their projected total is. Now, what I think is weird is the projected total down here is not weighted. Do you see that? Here's the item total. That's the total of the opportunity is this column right here. This projected total is giving the entire total and then it's taking, but up here, it is it is working, it's giving you worst, most likely an upside, right? You can tell because it's getting bigger. Your, your upside's always gonna be bigger than most likely, which is always gonna be bigger than worst case. So worst case scenario, Mary's gonna sell 51,000 um, this uh, month and her quote is 100. So she's gonna have to work really hard. What I don't like is that I don't believe these are are weighted. Because if you look at the totals, they're not coming out weighted. Does that make sense? When I clicked on these opportunities, these are the total of the opportunities. However, she can go in here. This contribution, by the way, is team selling. So that's why it says 100%. That's her contribution to the sale. If you did team selling, you could have two people selling on one opportunity, and then she would only get credit for 50% or whatever team selling percentage you give her, all right? But, but what's nice about this is she can see her whole universe of opportunities and know right away, oh my gosh, May's gonna be a bad month. I better, I better you know, work harder, do something to make this work. If you click on restore calculated, if it were doing the probability, if I came in and, and changed this number, then it would it would recalculate at um, at that item total number. I thought it should recalculate at the weighted because the forecast has weighted. So let's look at one of these. If we look at worst case, because it only includes the two, the 62 and a four, and a three, so that's 66, 70, 72-ish. It is weighted, isn't it? Well, 10, 75, yeah, it is weighted. I take all that back, the other report is not. So this worst case does look weighted because otherwise you'd have more than 62,000 there, right? So these are these are weighted, but the, the total here isn't the total that's showing um, up above, which I think is weird. I think it should be weighted in this column so that you know what is building up to the number up top. The number up top is weighted, which we see by forecast is weighted, but this projected total is really just the total of the opportunity, 
not the weighted total of the opportunity. Did I completely confuse everybody? <laughs> I confused myself earlier, so. Okay, yeah. Did you, is there a start date of uh, available for you? Yeah, and I've got 5 2019. And it's still pulling 17 yeah. in there? Yeah. I didn't do anything, but it could be in that sales preference. Does it say anything about, um, okay. I was gonna see if it was this use quotes and forecasts, but that is checked, so I don't know. It's a good question though. It shouldn't do that. It should only be the date range. So if you have added blank, then it could be point through, but you can see transaction date is like you can see a very good. Let's look. That's a really good point. Um, for those of you on the phone, we're talking about that there's an expected close date on the line. Did it open? On the line level, there it goes. The line level of an opportunity and the transaction level. And so, excellent point. I didn't even realize that. So, it's pulling it from the line level if there is a date and the line. And if there isn't a date on the line, it takes the transaction date. It is expected ship date is the I think the expected yeah. close date. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And so it's I used all header information on these opportunities. And so um, but if yours has line level, <clears throat> that's a good very good point. Okay, I think I have one minute. I'm gonna run through these reports. Um, so this report is called the um, forecast versus quota. And I could see that it, it was taking them um, and it's going to pull in the calculated. Remember that last screen we saw? It's gonna pull in the calculated, um, that's the one before that. And it's also gonna bring in their override so that you can see what your sales rep did. Did they change stuff? and then it gives you a for, forecast versus quota. There's also the um, forecast by status summary. See, these are the reports that bug me because every column is the same, worst case, most likely an upside, and they shouldn't be. They should have different numbers in them. And so this is the one that I think is either buggy or I didn't set something up right because you're seeing the same. Does, has anyone seen this before? And have an answer for me because I'm losing sleep. <laughs> so, no, I won't. I won't lose any sleep, I promise. Um, but this one, same thing, it was the calculated forecast. I was thinking, is one of these going to bring it up right? Now, this one is right. When you look at the forecast by sales rep summary, it is bringing them in with their, um, their they look weighted to me. And they look, uh, and they're obviously, they're building like that other report, the override one that we saw. And so, um, let's see, this one I was pulling up. Oh, to show you, you can run your forecast by customer also or by item. So you can see what items your forecast is sell or what your customers are gonna buy regardless of the sales rep. Um, this is that forecast accuracy where you say, week three uh, forecast to actual week four last week, and then their average accuracy. So you can start helping coach your sales reps on their accuracy of their forecast, because clearly you can't just have them doing blue sky every month and you're making decisions based on that. So you need to watch these. So very, it was, a like I said, that was a quick drive by and there's that one bump in the road that I haven't figured out why it's not working. But I, I really liked that the sales rep can change their forecast and then their manager can come in behind them and also update their forecast. So there's multiple ways to look at those forecasts and then report them to your um, company, especially if you're making decisions based on, on those sales. Any questions? 
Okay, thank you. We're going to switch over to Mike real quick for our tips and tricks, and then we're going to do a drawing for the Amazon gift card. So please hold tight, and then we'll have our open forum um, after the drawing. While I'm just setting up, can I just clarify something that I didn't mention before? With the online case form, which is probably the best way to get that customer. On that form, you can check a box that creates as a lead, basically as a so if your case comes in and there's no match, what it'll do is if you see, check the box and say create a company, I don't remember if it's like just, if you say create a company, then it'll create the company record and it will create a contact record. If you, if the box is not checked or checked, it'll create it as an individual and no contact record will be created. So lots of things there's a lot of things that happen. So much of Ending <laughs> Yeah, let me get that. Your speaker. Okay. I made you the presenter. You made me the presenter on my No, so you should it should give you I a. I did uh, get a window. Can you hit okay? I thought I did. Can you try making me again? This is the presenter. And then you gotta choose. Your screen. Yeah, click on that and then hit share. There we go. All right, wait, can you all hear me? No. No. The top switch is the top of switch. Can you all hear me? Is that better? Yeah. Ah, that is better. Cool. All right, so tips and tricks. Um, somewhat fair warning, I'm a little bit techy. I did our PDF. So this will be a quick overview. Some things are really simple, but I, I think one of these will be useful to everybody. That's my hopes. And uh, feel free to ask questions. I only have like eight or so. Um, so we'll see how the timing goes. All right. First one, this one was super annoying to me. So can y'all, y'all cannot see that, can you? So the first one is if you are, if you have, this is, if you have multiple roles or multiple environments, or like we have multiple environments and multiple roles in each environment, and every time you log in, the first thing you have to do is go change your role or change your environment because it never logs you into where you want to be. This is how to fix that. Um, so what you do is you log into NetSuite, click your name up in the upper right hand corner you'll get this list, um, this screen that says choose role. And there's this list of check boxes called default role. You check the one that you always want to log in as, done. So from that point on, if you log out and log in, you will always log in by default as that role into that environment. So that's super handy. Um, Okay, so must have hotkeys. I know we've covered this in other um, meetings as well, but it's like really important. And sometimes I, I'm guessing at least one of you might learn this like, wow, that's really cool. So the first, which I use like all the freaking time, 
is control click the house. So in NetSuite, there's this little icon that looks like a house. And um, an advantage to the house is that that screen usually comes up really quick. So if you hold down control on your laptop and just click the house, it'll open a new tab, taking you to your home page in NetSuite. So the kind of the advantage here is it pops you a new NetSuite screen that's quick. So if you've ever been in say like a saved search, it takes forever and then you like open a new tab or something and it opens that same saved search and now you're waiting for it to run and it takes forever. That's where the house thing comes in really handy. And the control click is just a really handy, It's that's more of a browser thing, like any link, if you hold down control and click it, it will open that link in a new tab. So that's really handy. Many of you probably use this all the time, but if you didn't know about it, try it, you'll love it, I promise. Um, also in NetSuite, something that I use a lot um, is Alt-G. So if, and I think in Mac, it's gonna be Meta-G. But uh, if you hit Alt-G, it takes you to the global search bar. So if you find yourself uh, constantly clicking to go up there, or like if you find yourself using these menu items a lot, um, and you'll see later in my presentation here, you can use that global search bar to quickly go to pages without having to remember like, oh, is that under customization or setup? I can't quite remember. You just know the name of the page and type it and search is the same way. Okay, um, next tip, faster CSV uploads. So this is primarily, I think, if you have the Sweet Cloud Plus licensees. Uh, if you don't, but you do CSV imports a lot and they're super slow, you may want to consider them for this very reason. Um, so the the CSV import assistant, y'all have probably seen the screen before, and there's this little box here, and I'm sorry it's blurry, but the box says advanced options. And I'd be willing to bet many of you have maybe clicked it once and said, I'm out, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but there's a couple of options there that are really useful. So the most useful is this little checkbox that says use multi-threading. So what that does is if you have the Sweet Cloud Plus, let's say you have four processors and you'll, you'll know how many you get, um, and you have a CSV file with 16,000 rows in it. Normally, if you didn't click this box and you imported it, you'd say, go start importing it and you'd like come back the next day. It takes forever. But if you have the Sweet Cloud Plus licensees, you have the 16,000 row CSV and you check this little box, what NetSuite will do is it will basically get your 16,000 rows and say, great, I got four CPUs, I got 16,000 rows, I'm gonna get these 4,000 to this processor, these to this, these to this, these to this, and you go as fast as 4,000. So it really speeds things up. Um, so again, that checkbox is called use multi-threading. I use it all the time. Unless like if, you know, if it's two or something like that, you just click on through. But if you're like me, if you're in this screen, you're probably doing a very large import. Uh, the other is Q number. So again, I apologize for the font, kind of small font size here. There's a little drop down here called Q number. And that's useful in that if you have a lot of people in NetSuite all doing CSVs and you get collisions where like they forgot to click use multi-threading. So now their imports running for like who knows how long, an hour, two hours, and you just want to do this little thing. If you didn't use this little drop down, what NetSuite's going to do is kind of put yours in the queue behind theirs. So like theirs will run for hours and they'll finish and then yours will run for like five minutes. But what you want to do is just like run yours while they're running theirs. And that's where this use queuing comes in. So I always like to pick queue number three. Again, I think the queues also come with Sweet Cloud. So if you don't have Sweet Cloud, you'll have to let me um, know whether you see this or not. Um, but it makes it useful where, again, like it doesn't matter which number you pick, just pick a number that nobody else is going to pick. And by default, it's queue number one. 
Um, so that's a kind of a handy tip for making your CSV imports faster. And then the third is worth mentioning, but I will also say I would recommend you not do this unless you know what you're doing. Um, there's a third checkbox down here that says run server suite script and trigger workflows. So the way NetSuite works with records is that anytime you modify a record, NetSuite can fire scripts and workflows to execute logic on that change. And in the context of CSV, well, you know, those, tr those scripts take time. They have to run and do whatever they do. If you uncheck that box, those things are not going to run. So it's a little bit like running the saw without the guard on. Like you're going to go faster, but if you're not careful, you're going to cut your finger off. So be careful on that one. Um, it is also, though, useful. I've found it mostly useful for where you have cases that you, you just want to update this one field. You know you want to update it. And you know your default logic is going to bonk you from updating it because of these other dependencies somewhere. If you uncheck that box and say, go do it, it's just going to update the field and that's it. All right, any questions on that? No? Okay. Okay, this is another one. So say you have a saved search. For us, it was revenue plans in a, in a uh, while back where you've created the search and you've been you've spent hours making this search and honing it down and refining it and you click go and it spins for like four minutes and you're like ah, it's going to come anytime now and it comes back and says sorry i'm out like no data this thing took too long you got to deal with it this is how to get around that so netsuite calls this persisting csv um so if you search uh suite sweet answers for persist or help, you all see it. The basic gist though is you make your search, it's gotta be a saved search. Go to page colon saved searches or search reports all searches. So you'll see this theme with my presentations a lot. Um, you hit alt G and type page colon saved searches and you're there. You don't have to worry about where it is in the menu. So go to save searches. Go find the search that you saved up here. You will see that there's a link. There's this column that says persist results with a link and it says persist CSV. <clears throat> Click that link. Then you wait, go and get coffee, get lunch. Because if it's taken a while for this search, it's going to take a while for the search. And then if you go to a page called search results, which isn't a great name for the page, but that is what NetSuite named it, um, you will see your search. It'll either be in like a running status or you'll see this link called download. So when it finishes, you'll get a little link there that says click here to download. This is super handy if you're doing save searches that are going to give you a lot of results. Like many, many megabytes of results. This is a way to do it. On that theme, what if you had a report? So in our case, what if I wanted to run the balance sheet detail for like a year and a half or two years? Uh, chances are pretty good the report's going to time out on you. Uh, we've also seen cases where, which is a little more scary, that the report would finish but give you partial results. Um, the trick here is when your report runs, you get this little box, and again, I'm sorry about the font size here, but you get this box, you all know it. It's got the little bar thing going in the middle, right? And if you look at the bottom of that box in this microscopic font, it says, click here when, or alert me when ready. It's like super small font, at least they underlined it. Um, you will probably be like me and you've never noticed, you've used NetSuite for years and probably never noticed it. It's there, click it in the whoosh, whoosh box and it will come back and say like, oh, I will tell you, I can't remember what it says, but it basically says, yeah, we'll, we'll tell you when you're ready. You'll get an email from your NetSuite instance. So if you do this in Sandbox, you may not, I don't remember how this works in Sandbox. 
um, but you'll get an email from NetSuite saying, your report's ready, click that. Or you can, from if you click that, it's gonna take you to this report results page, or you can go to page colon report results, and you will see your report listed there with a download link over here. So that's how to get around that uh, issue, which is very handy. Oh, hang on. I think I have one more. Yes, so did a file or script change? So in our shop, I recognize most of you aren't in this case, but there's a useful, useful case here. The useful case is, let's say you have bundles installed and you wake up one morning and something's broken and nobody knows why. That's probably the most classic use case here. Um, scripts are files, they, they are basically files in the file cabinet. And one of the things that NetSuite does with file cabinets, as you guys have seen, many records have system information where you can see, you know, like, oh, this user changed the, this item on the sales order or whatnot. Well, files, they will log something every time the file changed. So a really handy tip that we found is you create a saved search of type folder and you look for the <clears throat> file dot dot dot, the join field, file dot 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 last modified was like yesterday. And have that search email you if it finds anything and have it not email you if it doesn't find anything. Otherwise, you'll just, you know, it, you'll get an email every day with no results in it. Where this is super useful is um, if a bundle pushes, you'll get an email that morning, like, hey, these scripts change or these files change, which you might, you know, you'll look at the files and the name will be really weird, but I guarantee you, if you get this email in the morning and then later on, and you get people at your desk saying, why doesn't blah, blah, blah work? You'll be able to connect the dots. You'll be able to say like, where did this file come from? And if you, you trace back, you'll see, oh, the file came from bundle number blah. Oh, bundle number blah is the blah bundle. They must have given an update. So that's super useful. Um, if you do scripting in-house, it's also useful because if you or your developers push changes, you can see those come through as well. All right, and then the final one, which I'm a big fan of, so um, many people haven't heard of it, so probably a lot of you have heard of LastPass. So LastPass is um, like a cloud-based, keep my password and let it log me into everything. Uh, there's an open source version called KeyPass. I really like it, so I figured I would let y'all know that this thing exists. Um, the thing I like about KeyPass is in LastPass, your pass, your username and passwords are like in the cloud somewhere. They're in the secure, you have the password in some server somewhere. KeyPass is more like if you're old school like I am, like there is a file and you have the file and your stuff's in there and it's encrypted with the password that you gave it. So if you lose the file or you lose your you know, encryption key, obviously the file doesn't help you much. Um, I use this every day, I found it super valuable. So um, it's open source, it's been around for a really long time. You control the file. So if you're kind of that mindset, like I want the file with my passwords, it's in your control. It's compatible with freaking everything. So there's, a, there's Windows and Mac, and I use it on my Android. Um, and I use it in conjunction with Dropbox. So I'll get the file, my file, and stick it on my Dropbox, which then all my devices see. So I just run the app on my device and anytime I make a change here, it, Dropbox is over and everything else sees it. So that's really super handy. Um, it has what you would expect an auto type functionality. So I use this for NetSuite where, you know, you go to the browser and you hit control A and it says, boom, which one do you, you know, which NetSuite login do you want to use? I want to use that one, okay. So that's kind of nice versus, I'd be willing to bet some of y'all might have like, well, I use LastPass for this, but their browser has its own password thing for that. And like, it can get kind of messy. So FYI, that exists. It's useful for uh, maintaining passwords, especially if you like 
owning your stuff and not it out in the cloud somewhere. And that is it. So that is the end of the broadcast for those of you that are uh, attending remotely. Um, so I'm going to end that broadcast right now.